By the end of the 10th century BCE, the kings of Ashur began conquering more and more areas in northern Mesopotamia until they built a strong local kingdom. 200 years into this process, the Assyrian kingdom transformed into a vast empire. This was the largest and strongest empire ever seen in the area. It ruled over the entire Fertile Crescent, including for a limited period, parts of Egypt. The genre of Assyrian annals, which we mentioned in the previous lecture, provides historians with details regarding the endeavors of each Assyrian king during each year of his reign. We are thus able to reconstruct a clear picture of the political history of the Assyrian Empire. Here are some prominent kings of the Assyrian Empire. I will refer mainly to those who have some biblical connection. By the way, in this period we find for the first time a direct historical link between Mesopotamia and Israel, which is recorded in the historical texts of the time. The empire spread westward, and one of the many nations occupied by the great Assyrian kings was Israel. King Shalman Esser III was an aggressive conqueror who greatly expanded the boundaries of the empire. His inscriptions explicitly mentioned two Israelite kings, King Ahab and King Jehu. Shalmaneser campaigned against both. In 1846, Layard excavated at the city of Nimrud this imposing black obelisk, which we now know as the black obelisk. And it's a record of the long and successful military career of an Assyrian king called Shalmaneser. And we read about this on the inscription at the top. The five scenes that wrap around the obelisk each come from a different part of the world and what he seems to be doing is highlighting just how far he's able, been able to campaign. From a modern perspective, the most important by far is the second story here. Here we see uh, Shalmaneser himself and the winged disc up here. This is the god Ashur who protects him. Groveling on the ground is the figure, the key figure of the scene, and the caption tells us that this is somebody called Ya'u from the house of Humri. And it wasn't long when this uh, object came to scholarly attention and they worked out what the cuneiform said, what the cuneiform really meant. And it wasn't long, of course, before they related it to Jehu, and this must be the house of Omri, although, strictly speaking, it seems not to be from the house of Omri, but you can imagine from an Assyrian perspective, this is a detail that they weren't too bothered about or at least in the right part of the world. Tiglath-Pileser III was also a very powerful king. He conquered extensive areas of the Kingdom of Israel, exiling many of its inhabitants. His conquests significantly weakened the Kingdom of Israel. The Bible also tells us that he accepted the surrender of Ahaz, king of Judah. Shalmaneser V imposed the final siege on the Kingdom of Israel. The subsequent king, Sargon II, completed the process by destroying the kingdom and exiling its inhabitants. Sennacherib embarked on a famous campaign to Judah, during which Jerusalem was saved at the last minute, but Lachish was destroyed. The destruction of Lachish and the exile of its inhabitants are described in detail in a large relief from Sennacherib's palace. The palaces of the Assyrian kings were decorated with these wonderfully detailed carvings, these reliefs, originally brightly colored, now the paint has gone, all we can see is the, the stone underneath, but they preserve an incredible record of the deeds of the Assyrian kings. These come from the southwest palace at Nineveh, the palace without a rival, and here we can see at the start the Assyrian army mustering, attacking somebody, some poor unfortunate rebel or enemy. This is the key to the entire battle scene. Here we can see a defeated population has come out to grovel at the feet of somebody, and the Assyrian soldiers, the officers, and this high official are again approaching a figure to the right, and here he is sitting on a throne with some servants behind wafting the flies away, and this is so the caption tells us King Sennacherib, but importantly it also tells us where the city is 
and for them it's La Kisu, or as we know it, Lachish. And we know that uh, Sennacherib campaigned in 701 BC at the city of Lachish. He made it his headquarters for the invasion of that part of the world. And we have, of course, a parallel account from the Bible of exactly this episode. Finally, I will mention King Ashurbanipal, who built an enormous library in Nineveh that housed texts of a wide range of types from various periods. Ashurbanipal's library included more than 30,000 clay tablets kept together in a big archive and organized by shape and content. Ashurbanipal's library marks the era as a cultural golden age. The texts found in this library serve as a primary source of information on Mesopotamian culture, literature, and religion until today. Following Ashurbanipal's death, somewhere between 639 and 620 BCE, Assyria began to decline. The causes for this decline are not entirely clear, but the process was so swift that by 605 BCE, most of the empire's territory was ruled by a rival Babylonian dynasty whose center lay in southern Mesopotamia. <laughs> 